Well, hey, good morning, church. It is so good to have you with us this morning. I would ask you to stand, but that might be a little awkward in your living room. So however it makes you feel comfortable to worship this morning, we're glad that you chose to be with us. I'd like to read from the book of Psalm 139. David writes these words, and he says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb, and I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And I love that scripture because it reminds us that wherever we go, we are never too far from the Lord. Actually, the Bible says that where two or more are gathered, the Lord is present with us. And we're excited that even though we're worshiping in different locations today, some of you are at home, some of you might be in your office, some of you might be driving down the road, uh, we are present with the Lord and He is with us, He is indwelling us today. And I pray that you would receive a great blessing knowing that God knows you intimately and He loves you deeply. And we want you to experience him in a new and a fresh way today. Would you join me as we pray this morning? God, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you for the opportunity to gather, uh, to worship, to, to meet together, even in a digital world. God, we get to celebrate your goodness. And so this morning, God, we ask that you would uh, take the words that we offer to you as we sing, God, that they would be an acceptable offering to you. God, that as we meditate on your word, as we look at the scriptures today, God, that you would work in our hearts and our minds, that God, after we are done this morning, we would know you in a richer way, and God, we would be committed to follow you in a more full way. So bless us in those things, God. We ask you to be with us, and we ask, God, that you would uh, lead us out from here, that we might honor you by the way we live. We love you, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, let's worship.
Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us online. Uh, we are definitely living in some challenging times, to say the least. Um, probably full of fear, worry about COVID-19, the things that it's made us change, doing church online. Maybe you worry about your self getting sick, dying. Maybe it's your loved one that you're afraid might you watch and see them get sick. But unfortunately, even as we live through these times and COVID is is wreaking havoc on the way that we're doing things, people are still dying. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin are death. Recently, I lost uh, both of my grandparents, unfortunately on the same day, but now they're in glory with the Lord. But death is all around us, it's still happening. Today, unfortunately, I read an article about Ravi Zacharias. Uh, if 
you don't know who Ravi Zacharias is, he is a, a world-renowned apologist. Um, the guy's story is amazing. I encourage you to look him up if you don't know anything about him. He um, went from one day laying there contemplating suicide to be able to um, just change the world with his wisdom and his insight into what's happening and God's word. Um, if you don't know what apologetics is, apologetics is not about apologizing about your, your faith or, or anything of the nature. It's more defending your faith um, and doing it with, with humility. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. Or you might say with humility, this is what we promise. This is what is promised for us, a better future, no matter what the pandemic here on earth. And defending your faith is, is so much more than actually winning a battle or an argument or a decision, but it's about reassuring yourself that you have that faith inside of you. I had a very, very candid, deep conversation with a, a dearly beloved individual the other night. And after we were through having this conversation, neither one of us won and not many times will you win these arguments. And again, it's not about the winning or the losing. When we were done, I put my arm around him and I looked him in the eye and I said, all kidding aside, I'm a, I'm a kidder, but I said, all kidding aside, I have something that I want to leave you with that I want you to ponder. I said, when everything is said and done, when we finish this, this time here on earth, and if I'm wrong, what have I lost? I take an eternal dirt nap. You might be surviving me when living with the knowledge. Well, you wouldn't have the knowledge, but you might be thinking, ah, he was wrong. But really, really think about this. When you die, what if you're wrong? And I have to tell you that, that as I was preparing for this, um, God really put it on my heart. This is something that he was urging me to, to share with you. So I want to pose this. This is communion, but I also want to pose this to you, you guys who may not uh, be believers yet. Pose that same question to you. If you were to die, and if you're wrong, what are the eternal consequences? So as we begin to take the sacraments, we take two parts. We take the bread, which represents the body of Christ that was broken, that was beaten for us. And then we take the wine that represents the blood that was shed for you and I. Let's take the bread now. And as we drink of the cup, the cup of the new covenant, the promises that Jesus gave us, remember that no matter what's going on around us, no fears matter. We know and we can rest on his sacrifice that we have eternal life elsewhere. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we live in times right now that no one that is alive has ever seen. And so Lord, as we continue to plow through. I pray that each and every one of us has the faith to know that regardless of the situation, regardless of the good times, the bad times, that in the end, when we too will face death, that we can rest assured that we will be in glory with you. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice upon that cross. You took the place of where a sinner like me should have been. It's in Christ's sake name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate those words. So true. Let's consider where we are with the Lord, uh, absolutely, and the promise of eternal life that we have with Him. So today we got a special treat. Uh, you don't have to listen to me again today. Uh, one of our, uh, another member of our uh, speaking team, preaching team, uh, John Ardito, is going to be bringing a message today. We're in this series called Battle Strong. What does it look like to wage war against these issues that we face in life. And we've looked at some different subjects, and we're going to tackle another subject that really hits home for a lot of us today. And so uh, my prayer is that God would speak to you through John's message as we look at the Word of God together. Uh, before we do uh, get into the message today, let me just say uh, briefly, uh, you're getting ready to watch a video. Uh, I would encourage you, if you have uh, young people, if you have young kids, uh, like high school age, 
Um, you better get some tissues because uh, this is going to be a tough one. Um, actually, we are saying uh, congratulations to all of our seniors in high school this week and uh, wishing them a great future as we celebrate their graduation. And so uh, our youth ministry team, led by Brian Palmer, uh, put together a short video just to pay tribute to them and really a special message to them. So I do pray that you'll enjoy this. And we do, uh, seniors, we do wish you the very best. And we pray that God would bless you richly as you follow him all the days of your life. Take a look at this video. To the class of 2020. 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 And to the class of 2020. I can't even imagine what you're going through. Or even how you're feeling. I'm heartbroken for all that you have missed these past few months. Prom, parties, youth group, spending time with friends. And the thing you miss most is hanging out with me. Me, 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 me. This year has been filled with unknowns. Some of you are still trying to figure out what you're gonna do next. I wanna encourage you today in the time of the unknowns. There are some things I do know. You are loved. You are strong. I'm gonna cry. You are resilient. You are wonderfully made by our God. He has great plans for you. God has never messed up and he thinks that you are awesome and so do I. He has promised you that, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. So don't give up. Continue to keep your eyes focused on Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Press on to love like Jesus. Press on to chase after your goals. Don't let this pandemic stop you from what God has designed for you. And what God has designed for you to do. Press on to be kingdom workers wherever you go and whatever you do. Romans 12, 9 through 12. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. I will never forget the long summer camp rides to CIY that all the times and years that we share. Our impact championships, and yes, I said championships. The love you have for your community. The random acts of kindness you've shown to others. Like when you boys raised money for those kids going through chemo. And when you girls did a baby shower for Life Choices of Lake County. I love you. And in your heart. And we'll continue to keep praying for you. That's pretty. Dear God, we love you. I thank you that we've been able to have a little part in these guys' lives. They're awesome. And I know you have really big plans for them. Please be with them and continue to cover them in your love. In Jesus' name. Father, I just thank you for these young men and women. I thank you for the path that you already have laid out for them. You know, even though they might not be sure, just pray that they will trust you, continue to follow your ways, and never give up. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Dear Lord, please keep these kids in your heart and in your faith, and just keep uh, loving on them, because we do love them. Guide them through all their heartaches that they're gonna go through and all the filled things that they are gonna experience. And just please keep every one of them safe and keep them in your heart close to you. And I pray for every single one of them that life choices will just be really good, that they don't have to go through bad things. And I hope they just walk on the stones that I've showed them to walk through and stay off the ones that I've talked to them about. But dear Lord, please keep every one of these seniors in your faith and in your love. It's in Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you for today. And we thank you for these young men and women. We ask that you continue to hold them and love them and cover them with your grace and mercy and your love. Continuing to make them into the men and women that you've designed them to be since the time that they're in their mother's wombs. We look forward to so much we look forward to them growing up before our eyes. We look forward for the next 10, 15, 20 years of their decisions. 
and we can't wait to see what you do in their lives. Lord, we pray that you would love them and hold them tight and let them know that we love them each and every single day and that we support them. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for these seniors. Father, I, I pray that you continue just to work through them. Father, that they would lean into you, that they would uh, seek your guidance in everything they do, that they would put you at top priority in their life. And through that, that great things would happen. Continue to be with them. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. So it's uh, great to have you all join us today. Uh, first of all, I do want to say congratulations to all the seniors that are graduating. No, it's not quite what you pictured right now, but we are proud of you. Uh, we just wish you many blessings as you go forward in, in whatever you do in life, and uh, we just want to just thank you for, for what you do. So we are in this series, Battle Strong. We've been in it for about the past few weeks. Um, it is, so far we've been discussing impatience, we've discussed covetousness. We've discussed bitterness and anxiety. Today, we're going to talk about pride. So there was a preacher that decided that he was going to resign, and he had sent his letter of resignation one Sunday morning, and he explained that he was leaving to accept a calling to another church. He stood at the door after services, like a lot of preachers do, and one of the seniors had come up to him and said, oh, preacher, I'm so sorry you decided to leave. Things are just never going to be the same. The preacher was flattered, but he thought he would respond with some humility and some grace, and he said, oh, bless you, dear lady, but I'm sure God will send you a new preacher even better than I am. And she choked back a sob, and she said, that's what they all say, but they keep getting worse. Now, we've got to follow up Brent, so I guess we're getting a little worse as we come into me. But I want to ask you a question. How often are you tempted to think that you are more important than you really are? We like to be the center of attention. We like to promote ourselves. We like to receive praise from other people. We like the applause from other people. It causes us to be more concerned about ourselves than of others. So I read this good analogy this week on the subject of pride. It said, pride is the dandelion of the soul. Its roots go deep. Only a little left behind sprouts again. Its seeds lodge in the tiniest encouraging cracks. And it flourishes in good soil. The danger of pride is that it feeds on goodness. Today we're going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 6. And I'd like to start off by reading verses 1 through 4. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, follow along with me. It says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. You see, there are two kinds of pride. The first kind draws us closer to God. It's a healthy kind of pride. It's a, it's a kind of pride that you take when you're doing a job and you want to do it well. It's a pride that drives you to give your best. 2 Corinthians 7 says, I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I'm greatly encouraged in all our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. Paul is proud to see his work in Corinth producing good seed. It's the kind of pride you take with your children and your grandchildren. In Proverbs 17, 6, it says, Children's children are a crown to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. In this verse, crown and pride are descriptive ways of saying the same thing, that it's right and it's proper for grandparents or parents to feel a sense of pride about their children. 
See, the second kind of pride, that drives us further from God. It's a spiritual disease that God despises. In Proverbs 16, 5, it says, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. See, pride is the one thing that keeps you from celebrating other people's successes. It's the one thing that keeps you from initiating an apology when you know you're wrong. It's the one thing that keeps you from initiating an apology when you're 5% wrong and the other person's 95% wrong. It's the one thing that keeps you from, keeps you from arguing your point, even when you realize you don't have a very good point to argue. Pride keeps you from admitting that you've lost. It keeps you from admitting weakness. It keeps you from admitting that you need help, that you don't know what you're doing, although everyone else knows that you don't know what you're doing. It keeps you from being honest with yourself. It keeps you from being honest with others. It keeps you from learning new things because you want people around you to think you know everything. Pride is what causes you to feel good when others failed. It's what causes you to power up when you should be opening up. It's what causes you to cheat before you lose. It's what causes you to lie about your past. It's what causes you to have the final word. It causes you to buy things to impress people who aren't even looking at you. And it causes you to have to be the center of attention. Jesus addressed one strain of pride, disease, in the Sermon on the Mount. And he talked about the kind of people who like to be the center of attention. See, just like today, there were people in that day who liked to be the center of attention, that liked the accolades and the applause and the acclaim of others. They were people who liked to toot their own horns. In Matthew 6, Jesus addressed three main issues. He addressed giving, he addressed prayer, and he addressed fasting. But what he doesn't say is if you give and if you pray or if you fast. Instead, he says when you give and when you pray and when you fast. See, Jesus expects us to do good things. I mean, if I'm a follower of Jesus, shouldn't I be looking to do good things to help people that are struggling? By helping those people, doesn't that help me grow closer to God? And that cause people to give God the glory? And in an earlier part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what is Jesus talking about in our main passage today? See, he's addressing doing good things for the wrong reasons. See, it's me doing good so that other people will think that I'm wonderful instead of thinking that God is wonderful. When I do that, I'm just tooting my own horn. Jesus says that self-promotion is hypocritical. Now, the word hypocrite comes from the Greek, and it had to deal with actors. See, back in the first century, actors would be in troops, and they would travel to town to town, and they would have masks to denote what character they were playing. Jesus says that tooting your own horn is acting like someone you're not, something you're not. When you're, fully, when you're full of unhealthy pride, you put on a mask to make other people see something that isn't genuine whether it's generosity or virtuosity. The problem with pride is that you can clearly see it in other people, but you can't see it in yourself. There are two reasons why Jesus warns us about pride. The first reason is because it's self-serving. In Jesus' example, these people were supposed to be giving to the needy, but they weren't really concerned about the needy. They were only concerned about promoting themselves. Sadly, if recognition wasn't there, they probably wouldn't have done anything. Someone said, I wonder to what extent charities would be supported if they did not publish an annual list of donors. That's a sad thought, but it's probably true. And, you know, it's true in church, too. You know, there are people that will give more to a project just to get a plaque on the wall. Galatians 5.26 says, Let us not be ambitious for our own reputations, for that only means making others jealous. The second reason Jesus warns us about pride is because it's self-destructive. Pride doesn't make you bigger and stronger. It makes you weaker and smaller. See, pride diminishes you. It diminishes your capacity to admit what you have to admit. It diminishes your capacity to acknowledge what you need to acknowledge and your ability to apologize when you need to apologize. 
It keeps you from saying what needs to be said, keeps you from hearing what needs to be heard, and it keeps you from giving what needs to be given. Pride crowds other people out. When you're full of you, there's no room for anybody else. And the danger of that is pride even has the potential to crowd out God. Pride has the potential to crowd out God. Psalms 10.4 says, In his pride the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts there is no room for God. Pride is a prison. It shuts me in and it shuts God and others out. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, said this about pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Think about that sentence. Pride leads to every other vice. Former heavyweight boxer James Quick Tillis was raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He left the Sooner State behind and he moved to Chicago where he wanted to start fighting. So he boarded, this is in the mid-1980s. He boarded a bus. He got off the bus in Chicago in the Windy City. He had two cardboard boxes, uh, suitcases under his arms. He stopped in front of the Sears Tower. He looked up at the top of the Sears Tower and said, I'm going to conquer Chicago. And when he looked down, his suitcases were gone. If you exalt yourself, God has a way of humbling you. James 4, 6. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So the question is, how do we cure unhealthy pride? How do we avoid self-promotion? How do we keep from tooting our own horn? First, Jesus says that we should resist the temptation to impress. He tells us that prideful people do a lot of what they do to be honored by men. They want to impress people. They like to show off. They want people to take notice of them and have a high opinion of them. There's a story about a newly elected congressman. He went to his assigned office on Capitol Hill, and the only thing in his office was a desk, a desk chair, and a phone. And he was sitting down behind the desk, and he was taking it all in and thinking about everything that was going to happen. He was new to this. And he heard somebody walking towards him. So he quickly picked up the phone and he said, yes, Mr. President, I'm glad that I, my plan worked. And I'm glad I could help you save all those lives. No, I don't need any public recognition for this. Just the fact that my plan worked is good enough. Thank you, Mr. President. And he hung up. And he looked at the gentleman standing in front of him and said, yes, sir, what can I do for you? And the guy said, well, I was really here to help you. I was here to set your phone up. We have things that we do because we want people to think that we're important. That's why we go to great lengths to boast. This cause goes so much deeper, though, because one reason we brag and blow our own horns is because we are so insecure. We need attention from others to boost our self-esteem. I mean, why shouldn't I base my self-image on other people's opinions? Well, let's think about two considerations. First consideration is that people are often fickle. They will give their approval one day, and they will criticize you the next day. I mean, think about this. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on the first day of the last week of his earthly life, people shouted, Hail Jesus. And by the end of the week, they were shouting, Nail Jesus. People are inconsistent in their opinions. And the one thing is, it's impossible, impossible to please everybody. You just can't do it. The second consideration as to why we shouldn't base our self-image on other people's opinions is most of the time they're wrong. One newspaper ripped Abraham Lincoln's speech, the Gettysburg Address, apart, said that his remarks were inappropriate and not worth mentioning. Now, Edward Everett was a well-known orator at the time, spoke before for two hours before Abe Lincoln gave that speech. Abe Lincoln's speech was 300 words. Which one do you remember? Do you even know who Edward Everett is? Thomas Edison's grade school teacher told him he was stupid and he would never amount to anything. Obviously, we know what Thomas Edison has done. He holds over 1,000 patents in the United States plus Europe. People are often wrong. 
and it's unwise to impress them because their views are frequently distorted and their opinions are regularly wrong. And Jesus gives a second thing to do to avoid being prideful. It says simply let your good deeds speak for themselves. Let your good deeds speak for themselves. Don't go out of your way to draw attention to yourself. Don't draw attention to what you've done. Put your horn back in the case. Put your horn back in the case. If they're truly good deeds, then they'll be rewarded by God. True greatness needs no trumpet. It speaks for itself. Some of you will remember Gregory Peck. He was a Hollywood actor, a very famous Hollywood actor. He won an Oscar for Best Male. He was nominated four more times in the same category. And early in his film career, he went to one of the most exclusive restaurants in Hollywood. He wanted to go into the reserved seating area, but the maitre d' told him that the seating was all full. Well, a friend that was with Gregory said, Gregory, why don't you just tell him who you are? And Gregory Peck said, if I have to tell him who I am, then I ain't. If you have to announce your greatness to people, then you're not so great. Third thing Jesus says to do to avoid being prideful is to resolve to do good whether you're recognized for it or not. Resolve to do good whether you're recognized for it or not. If you make a decision, stick to it. It will keep you from being puffed up. Some of you have seen the, the movie, the Bruce Almighty films. There was two of them. Yes, there were two of them, if you haven't. But the second one starred Steve Carell, and the premise behind that was he had to build an ark for the idea that there was a flood coming. Now, Steve Carell had been voted into Congress and was a little full of himself, so God decided he was going to knock him down a little bit. Well, he had him build this ark. Now, I'm not going to go down a rabbit trail and rabbit hole and show you and talk about the whole film, but just know that towards the end, there was something else involved besides just building this ark, and it was the idea of what ark stood for, which is an act of random kindness. An act of random kindness. If you have trouble with this area, send somebody a card of encouragement. Don't sign it and don't put your return address on it. Help a complete stranger who can't thank you and it will never know who you are. Don't seek honor from human beings. Just seek honor from your Heavenly Father. Your reward is helping others, not receiving recognition for it. Giving in secret is a way to train yourself not to toot your own horn because there's no one to listen. There's no one to brag to. Finally, Jesus advises you to change your aim in life. If your aim is to get noticed by other people, Jesus says that that's the only reward you're going to get. If you give to demonstrate your own generosity, you'll receive some admiration from other people, but that's all you're going to ever receive. That's your payment in full. But if your aim is to simply do things with the right motive, then you will receive heavenly reward. Your decision comes down to choosing between two completely opposite aims. Will I please myself by pleasing people, or will I do what pleases God? Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says, Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. The truth is this, that pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. Pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. Now the opposite of pride is humility. And Jesus taught a modeled and radical liberating version of humility. It's this version of humility that will unwrap you from the confines of pride. It can unlock the door of your pride. This radical version of humility defines greatness by how well you serve others and not how well you are served. It defines greatness by how passionate you are about doing things for others and not about getting things done for you. The definition of greatness turned upside down. Reflecting on the standard of humility years later, Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man 
he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Your choice today is simple. You either choose between the disease of pride or the cure of Christ's humility. Which one are you going to choose? The one that kills or the one that gives life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings you continue to pour upon us. We thank you for your son Jesus Christ and what he did for us, the example that he set for us, turning the world upside down, Lord, knowing that we need to be servants, not to be served, knowing that we need to step out of our way for pride, that we need to open our hearts and our minds to the idea that what Jesus said is the right way. And Father, again, we are grateful for what you continue to do for us, for your son going to a cross to accept our sin. And as always, we pray in your son's perfect name. Amen. Well, hey there, church. I hope that you were challenged by that message on pride just as much as I was. I mean, it's something we all battle with. It's a, a wrestling match that we have often in our life where we desire things for ourselves rather than putting others first. And so I appreciate John's words from the scripture. Hey, let me just remind you of a couple things that are coming up. We're beginning to start opening some things back up again, doing some uh, ministry things here at Lake Eustis. So starting this Tuesday, we're going to be launching back our volleyball nights at North Lake Community Park up in Umatilla. Love to have you come out for that. That's 6.30 in the evening on the volleyball courts. Just a, a fun time of uh, social gathering and uh, some competitive uh, nature volleyball. It's going to be a lot of fun. So bring your family out. It'll be a lot of great uh, fellowship. Also want to remind you that Pioneer Club, uh, which is our elementary age ministry on, on Wednesday nights, are going to be having their award ceremony, but a little bit different. They're going to be having actually a drive through award ceremony on May the 26th. You can ask Cindy about that. There's more information on the app and our website as well. I want to encourage you to remember that um, worship is going to start back in person on May the 31st. We're, man, so excited about that. So join us on May the 31st here. We're going to have everybody in the sanctuary and excited about that. More information is on our website and our Facebook page also on that. I want to encourage you to continue your giving. You can either uh, mail in checks uh, in your offering for your offering, or you can uh, do your giving online and support Faith Promise, our missionaries around the world, uh, all those things. We appreciate your commitment to worship the Lord through giving, even in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, so from a leadership perspective, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts doing that. One more thing is we've been trying to get uh, our building tinted for termites and termite damage for a long time. And so we are actually going to be doing that this week. And so starting actually tomorrow, Monday, we're going to be uh, tinting the building. And so we're not going to be in the building for uh, in terms of our office staff. We're going to be working from home next week or this week. And so if you would uh, like to contact us, you need to do that through email or our cell phones. And we'll make sure that we respond as quickly as we can to those things. And um, so just wanted to keep you in the loop of that. Uh, also, we're making preparations for putting our steeple back up as soon as the fumigation is over. So some good things, some exciting things happening at Lake Eustis. Thanks for joining us this morning in worship. And go out and be the church wherever you go. God bless. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.